Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Darshan Talks. We have Patrick Stone with us as always. He is our favorite ex-FDA auditor uh, who is always kind, always comes online and talks to us about his experiences uh, at FDA um, investigating and auditing multiple sites, multiple sponsors, um, and not and multiple manufacturers. This is the Darshan Talks podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at DarshanTalks.com. Welcome, Pat- uh, Patrick. Tell us more about yourself before we jump in. Sure. For the past uh, nine years, so I was with FDA for 13 years. For the past nine years, almost 10 now, um, I've been assisting with uh, the manufacturing of drugs. Uh, but lately, I've been assisting more with the um, clinical research side, the, the good clinical practice side. And uh, <clears throat> there's been a lot of uh, new uh, orphan drugs and um, uh, fast track drug uh, sponsors that, that have uh, needed assistance. So that's typically where I'm at right now, assisting uh, sponsors make their way to market if everything looks uh, safe and effective. Okay, so we're talking about sponsors coming to market. We're talking about what steps they take. Here's my first question, Patrick. In these times of COVID, have things slowed down in in sponsors bringing products to market? I think they have accelerated from from my perspective because what I'm seeing is more sponsors are coming uh, to consultants like myself to get things done um, in a different way. Uh, we can do more virtually, we're finding out for the past seven months than we could traveling around chasing uh, compliance per se. Uh, so <clears throat> in my guesstimation, I would say there's more because um, it's it there's two factors involved in that one is the fda um is a lot more collaborative these days and uh, a lot more um they're providing a little more assistance and and uh consulting in in a certain way not pure consulting but they're not telling sponsors look you figure it out we'll talk to you later that's not their approach anymore their approach okay. is Let's work on this. Let's see if we can get this done compliant. And um, and they're uh, in a little more collaborative vein, per se. So you see a lot more sponsors or a lot more organizations um, that are bringing uh, products to market that, per se, would have taken a little longer or uh, would, it, would have um, needed more money now because of the fast track and and the uh the, the abridging per se i mean we're not shortening things but we're somewhat abridging them from an fda review standpoint so uh it would make sense that you would see a flood of of products trying to you know emerge in that type of setting so before we we talk about the quote unquote abridging process do you again speaking as someone who follows the industry who follows uh, clinical research, do you think this is a result of the new FDA commissioner or do you think this is just the direction the industry was headed and the FDA is finally accepting it? Well, so the commissioner has some parts to do with that. I mean, basically they're, you know, part of a cabinet and, and you know, the cabinet direction kind of stipulates some of this, but I th- I think what we're seeing more of is the actual centers are um, opening up their uh, avenues, you know, and uh, they're really the ones that drive this, you know, Cedar, Seber, they're the driving forces, you know, for whether a product makes it or not, not necessarily the commissioner. The commissioner just gives them uh, kind of a direction. But I think what we've seen in the last, um, you know, three to four years with the right to try. And um, even even at the, um, you know, I would say even six to seven years ago, a little further than that, it seemed like um, the administrations were are, are wanting the 
long process of approval to be abridged, to be shortened in the way that is safe and that we still follow the quality by design uh, specifications that, that are laid out in, in the CFR, 21 CFR. So quick question, Do, uh, and again, I, I have to admit, I haven't looked into this uh, recently, but QBD, quality by design, I've, I've always thought of it more um, as a manufacturing process uh, connection. I know there, there was a discussion about doing it in clinical research. Did the guidance on that come out and I, did I just miss it? No, there, there, it's always been a full system approach, right? So um, the quality system is embedded into the quality by design paradigm. Um, right. And basically the quality by design paradigm is ICH. It's the sure. uh, improvement or the harmonization of all of our regulatory bodies that are involved in ICH um, to, to streamline uh, every aspect, okay? Not just the manufacturing, but, but the uh, parallel, in a parallel sense, uh, the road to market as well. So, so it does all fit together. Okay. It all fits together because now, like think of even three years ago, would you have seen a quality agreement between a CRO and a sponsor based on GCP? No, you, that's the funny thing that, that those are starting, I'm starting to see them, yeah. Well, it's mandatory now. It's not, you, you shouldn't just start seeing them. ICH requires it. And really? I haven't seen enough yes. to, for, to know that. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. A6R3, well, really R2-R3, uh, because we're already in the R3 uh, paradigm, We cause, because it's been provided, right? The guidance is out. Uh, <clears throat> there's a very strict part in there that spe specifically says quality agreements are necessary for GCP. And we want to see them. So, and they're they're also described as you would see a GMP quality agreement, where there are penalties, or not per se penalties, but if let's say um, the CRO gets it wrong, well now you know at their own cost they have to either figure out root cause or remediate, um, which typically wasn't something that the big box CROs would agree to, uh, and now they have to. So I have to admit, uh, I, we, we started this conversation with me thinking about doing a full-blown conversation around uh, virtualization. I really want to talk about that, but you've raised so many other questions and uh, we'll, we'll talk about those hopefully if we get a chance, otherwise we'll push into the next podcast. I'll weave them in, right? Because, you know, it's part of our, our current uh, operating setup, right? We, we have no choice. If we want right. to get the work done, we have to do it virtually. So we'll... We'll weave them in, in in the discussion for sure. Exactly right. So so let's actually start by talking about um, the, this push towards uh, the combination of virtualization of studies, the decentralized studies, and and has COVID. I mean, everyone talks about this right now. I just read an article saying that uh, investors are putting in some serious money behind um, decentralized uh, studies. So if that's true, how does auditing a, um, a decentralized study differ from what you did say a year ago? Well, first of all, what, what I see is um, the price for operating has gone down from my perspective and from my client's perspective, because in the past, let's say that we had a multinational trial, right? Uh, and they had we, you know, we always do this risk based approach to which sites will be chosen. And it's, you know, usually the uh, sites that have the most subjects or the sites that have the most SAEs or the most uh, deviations. Protocol deviations is another risk ranking factor. Um, and, and then they would send me off, you know, to France or to South America or to uh, Michigan, wherever. Uh, and horrible. Now, and now what we're seeing is they're asking me to do this virtually because some of these countries won't even let someone from us in and we're, we're getting them done quicker uh, with the same amount of uh, compliance review. Uh, some of my sponsor uh, clients were very apprehensive six months ago 
about uh, being virtual in a QA audit. Now we've seen the virtualization in monitoring because FDA has been talking about that for the last 10 years. Uh, you know, the, the decentralization models yep. and the models of you don't have to go to the site for every monitoring visit. You can do st certain things virtually and we would say that you can get a lot more done that way. Um, and, and that was the guidance that they put out. So, you know, we've seen it from a QC perspective, but now they're needing to do this from a QA perspective, which is a lot different. So, so let's, let's start from the beginning. Let's say you are still at the FDA and a COVID has hit and um, you have someone, and, and you have a, put, a potential sponsor you, you want to audit. Talk to me about how you choose your sponsor. Talk to me about how you'd walk through an audit. Well, so if we're, we're talking about an FDA uh, audit, so those always come yeah. from the review division. So I would be getting an inspection um, from them, like a, a, an assignment. And they would have uh, sponsor A, let's just say ABC, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, Typically, though, what, what gets audited first, you know, let's say this is tied to a market application. Typically, three to four clinic sites get audited first. So they send me to those clinic sites uh, first. And then after the, um, we call it ammunition is gathered or the deviations or the gaps, what, however you want to call them. After those have been gathered from those clinic site audits, and those audits are centered around safety. They're centered around data validation, data integrity, and they're centered around um, IP accountability. Obviously, protocol adherence is in there, and that comes, you know, through reviewing the records. But the most important aspects are obviously safety and data of validation. Uh, so once you know those are done, and there's a the, the review division has their cycles between that. Then they come up with a long list of items to cover for, for the inspector uh, during the audit. And, and those laundry list of, of items in many cases are, are what makes or breaks the application itself, whether the, the sponsor is inspection ready. Uh, but as far as preparing for these audits, it's very different to prepare for a clinic site audit, which is pretty much cut and dry. And there's a uh, playbook and that playbook is, is uh, a compliance program guide, 7348.811, I believe. And um, it gives you every question, every area of coverage. And, and this is where you find some of the quality by design aspects in those compliance okay. program guide. And uh, and then for the sponsor audit, it's it's completely different because first of all, you have stop for a second. Go ahead, go ahead. Stop for a second. So you 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 just currently finished a uh, a site audit. You found some discrepancies, and now you're going to go. Are you are you directly going to jump to the sponsor? Or are you going to go? Uh, are you part of an SMO and audited the SMO itself? Or are you going to jump to the CRO? What what is that process, if you will? Right. Uh, so yeah, af after you gather the um, site-specific gaps and in information, then you can work on what SMOs per se, what what uh, what vendors um, or the sponsor themselves. Typically, the FDA doesn't chase the uh, application. They also do not chase the manufacturing. They're going to expect the sponsor to have all that information at the headquarters there and be able to speak to. Uh, the oversight and the issues involved with any deviations or uh, what we would call 43 observations uh, listed from, from those site audits. Uh, so, so the sponsor should have all vendors, subcontractors, SMOs, uh, information so that they can, uh, you know, whether it's a QC person or a QA person, from the quality unit uh, speaking to those aspects. You know, if, if I find a direct uh, observation relating to an SMO, uh, then I will want to see the plans in place, 
the SOPs for oversight in place and the uh, certificates of review or audits. Uh, and that's that's how I would follow that that uh, thread or, or that aspect. Um, it all gets done at the sponsor. So, so I, I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. So you would what you would typically do is you would start from the site, collect data based on the data that data will tell you whether you need to go to the SMO level or d jump to the sponsor. Once you get to the sponsor, you'll look backwards again, look at the sponsor themselves, evaluate what they have with the CRO and or the SMO and go from there. Did I, so you're coming in both directions. Did I understand both that correctly? Directions. No, that's correct. That's absolutely correct. Um, and, you know, there's a lot to be gleaned at the site that that QA has to uh, be uh, aware of, right? I mean, you're not just looking at did the, did the principal investigator follow the protocol? You're looking at how the monitoring went, how the training of the site went. Uh, you're comparing the TMF um, data or documents for essential documents with what's at the site. So there's a lot that you can tell in this, whether the system is in control and functioning as should, as it should, or whether it's broken down somewhere. So, so you're talking about whether the system's broken down somewhere and you're talking about um, the, the overall general process. Let me ask you a couple of things that have been in the news and how you would land up chasing those or if you would even chase those. So the first one would be the right to try. Um, you, fi you find out from the grapevine or you find out somehow that uh, this sponsor uh, has had some potential subjects who have uh, invoked the right to try. Do you go and audit that or how does that play itself out? Typically, unless they, um, those subjects show up on a med watch or some sort of uh, adverse event that maybe is unexpected or is um, is a death, you know, yeah, you, you would want, you know, especially if, if there's a trending, but if there isn't trending um, and, and uh, these subjects are uh, taking this product on a right to try basis, it, it somewhat falls in line with the um, compassionate use that we used to have as, as the, our go-to or, or the emergency use. I mean, the right to try has just uh, expanded on those two uh, avenues of allowing subjects to take a product when, when they are, um, you know, so the right to try is, is not one of these where you have to be in late stage or in, a, in an almost death stage to do the trying, which is what compassionate and emergency use was. Now we've expanded that. So they're, they're, uh, you know, we don't have enough inspectors to cover that, that type of paradigm where you would be looking at that. Um, the, again, it's always risk-based. So the, the decision-making will be on a risk-based approach and only those right to try uh, projects that have these serious uh, consequences or uh, critical outcomes then for sure they will be looked at by FDA. So, so you, you mentioned the word critical outcome. People, again, no, I'm not sure I know the answer to this question, but uh, I believe the, the president used uh, a product, I think it was Regeneron, wasn't it? Um, yes, Regeneron. And it was, right, and I believe it was uh, thought to be an under compassionate use. My question for you is obviously the president of the United States is as critical as it gets. So from, from that perspective, would you, when I say you, obviously we're talking about the FDA, would they, they go and audit Regeneron to make sure that their, pro, their process is as clean as can be? Would that typically happen up front? Uh, or if this is an emergency situation, you sort of go, you backtrack it. How, how would this have played itself out, do you think? Well, for sure, it would be an after the fact uh, review. Um, and, uh, you know, unless the commissioner or some uh, surrogate of the commissioner got involved, um, it really wouldn't be looked at per se, unless something bad happened to to the sure. president, right? So because 
we see a um, an effectiveness, right? The uh, he's able to operate. There's there's no intubation. There's no criticality to the case. Um, I think that it would be looked at at a later date, and and obviously what the FDA is looking for is more how many. So if if we're talking about onesies, twosies, which we're not talking about in this case because uh, the president probably isn't the only one getting that medication on on that uh, right. right to try use. So if enough individuals uh, warranted that, so statistically significant amount of because that's where it always comes in, right? If, if it's significant, the FDA gets interested. Otherwise, they leave it until um, it's it's actually marketed, you know, ap- applied for marketing. So that takes me to um, sort of finishing out the concept around compliance. And the two other issues, um, well, I'm going to start with, I'm trying to decide, I'm trying to choose because I'm trying to be uh, specific about which questions I ask you. But... Um, have you, did, are you aware that the FDA just put out a new uh, proposed guidance around intended use? Uh, I hadn't seen that. I mean, wh- are we talking like a couple of months or, or just like recent weeks? Like in the last few days, actually. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm happy so to send you that. I, I have, yeah, I would definitely like to see that because I have three um, sponsors that, that I'm working with right now, and those are some of the issues. Okay, I'll make sure I send that to you. But the reason I was asking that question is, um, do you do you look at potential clinical trial patient recruitment ads to evaluate things like intended use based on the ads themselves and the types of claims that are being made? Or is that outside the scope of what you would be doing in an audit? No, I, I that is well within the scope. I look at all IRB reviews and approvals, and I match those reviews and approvals with the way that recruitment was done. Uh, and and what we're finding is that um, for the most part, um, you know, the clinic sites or the principal investigators are using those approved uh, materials. Um, now, what we sometimes see though is that the principal investigator, a sub investigator, uh, do somewhat of an ambulance chasing where they know subjects are coming in to clinics and they, they, they pop up on their bedside. Uh, and this is subjects that they aren't familiar with or that are not in their clinic. And, and, and they, you know, kind of ask them about the trials that that's where we see some of this, some of the issues when you get that type of chasing of, of the subjects um, in, in their weakest moment or in a hospital bed per se. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, for the most part, you know, the IRB is very strict on this. Um, the monitors are looking at it. So it wouldn't be just something that me as a QA or me as an FDA inspector would be focusing on. It should be what the monitor is looking at and working on with the sites and, and ensuring that their recruitment is uh, within the approved uh, process and, and that it's it's uh, transparent to everyone involved. So you, it's funny you mentioned transparency because that was gonna be my next question, um, which was, as, as I'm, I'm sure you know, the FDA put out a guidance basically saying that uh, we want to make sure that as part of our transparency initiative, you, you register on clinicaltrials.gov. Is that something you, you tend to look at it when you audit? Again, obviously the monitor should be doing that uh, and, and the site itself should be doing that depending on the type of study it is or the sponsors should be doing that. Um, but again, do you actually go back and look just to make sure? Right, yeah, that's one of the first things I do is a search on the title, the number, and um, the specifics that are provided in, in uh, uh, govtrials.com. And uh, because what I find is a lot of times that that's like not correct or they don't match. Yep. Uh, so so exactly. that is something we look for, something I specifically look, I mean, I would say hopefully the good, the good auditors will be <laughs> looking for that, but, um, and it's on my template, it's on my check sheet. You know, I have a checklist for everything I do. That checklist is based on FDA current practices. And so the FDA yep. for sure, you know, I did that 
as a uh, FD auditor and I still do that as a contractor. So, and, and you, you put that into a 483 if they are not compliant? Oh yeah, if that doesn't match up, I mean, for sure, because uh, then, then we have, you know, change control issues or, uh, you know, essential document mismanagement. There's all sorts of uh, observations that cascade because of that one item. Right. So, so obviously, Patrick, you've done this a bunch of different times. Uh, if people want to contact you and, and need your help, how do they find you? Sure. Uh, so you can come to my website, tradestoneqa.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I'm definitely there as well. Uh, but uh, for sure, those are the best ways to, to contact me right now. And uh, I thank all of your listeners for their time and uh, wish them all patient safety endeavors. Awesome. Thank you again for, for jumping on again, Patrick. I appreciate your time as always. Thank you. This is the Darshan Talks podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at darshantalks.com.